Welcome to the Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. The government's power to control one's life derives from its power, the state's coercive power to tax. If we want to arrest the growth of government, the place to start is with the tax burden it places on its citizens. One of our real champions in the fight to roll back government is Grover Norquist, the founder of the Americans uh, for Tax Reform. And in my view, in the view of many other people, no one in modern times has fought harder to shrink the state by keeping the issue of high taxes and IRS abuses in the public eye than Grover. As he puts it, Americans for Tax Reform opposes all tax increases as a matter of principle. Grover founded uh, ATR in 1985 at President Reagan's request, and he's been doing a lot of good ever since. Um, it works to limit the size and cost of government, opposes higher tax rates at the federal, state, and local levels, um, and supports tax return that moves towards taxing consumed income one time at one rate. Um, Grover has also organized the taxpayer, taxpayer Protection Pledge, which asks all candidates for federal and state office to commit themselves in writing to the American people to oppose all net tax increases. Uh, Grover's got a pretty good education. He went to Harvard undergrad and Harvard Business School, and uh, he's been doing a lot of good with his Harvard MBA uh, ever since. So Grover, welcome. I'm glad you're here. You and I have known each other for years, and I'm, I'm glad we're finally getting to this. Well, good to be with you. Um, well, let's let's start with what's you 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 and I talked a bit shortly about. There's some good things happening right now um, in the states, where the, there's a movement among states to uh, either get rid of their income tax altogether or um, move to a flat tax, and that, that's a that's a movement that's building steam. And and uh, I think it's something you've helped initiate. So so what's what's the stat? What's the state of play there now? Sure. Uh, right now, there are eight states that have no uh, personal income tax at the state level. Yeah, you know them, Texas, Tennessee, Florida, and a bunch of others. Uh, but those are the big ones. And uh, there are uh, 11 states that have a flat rate, single rate tax in the United States. Uh, in the last two years, five states have voted to go to a single rate tax. Uh, two of them, Arizona and uh, Idaho already got there, uh, and the other three, uh, uh, Mississippi, uh, Georgia, and Iowa, are all have a, like a two or three year path to get down to a single rate tax. And what they're doing is, is income comes in, uh, they drop the income tax rates, both, it, it, so they'll pick the rate, it's 3.9% in Iowa. The rates above 3.9 disappear, and the rates below 3.9 disappear. Uh, so you've got a situation where nobody sees their taxes go up. Uh, and uh, what you do have is a single rate tax. Now, uh, it'll probably take them four years to get down. They started at 8.6%. They're going to 3.9. They had a very progressive income tax in uh, Iowa. Uh, and it's a huge victory for taxpayers. That they, one of the highest tax states, their corporate rate was about 12%. Uh, is bringing both the corporate and the individual rates down. So, uh, and in the state of New Hampshire, which people think of as a no income tax state, but it isn't, it taxes dividends and interest. Uh, but uh, they at 5%, same as Massachusetts next door, it's not, not any better than Massachusetts when it comes to taxing your savings and investment. They don't tax wages, but savings and investment, yes. So uh, Governor Sununu signed a bill that the legislature passed a year ago uh, and over a five-year period, that goes down five, four, three, two, one, zero. So it will be a no-income tax state that doesn't require any triggers. It's just going flat, straight to zero. Um, and so what we found is single rate taxes, and there are two kinds. There's eight states have a zero single rate, and then other states have three, four, or five uh, as a single rate uh, tax. Single rate taxes are lower than graduated income taxes. Single rate taxes um, protect every citizen uh, because when the politicians wanna raise their taxes, they have to look at everybody in the state and say, I'm gonna raise all your taxes for this project. So it, point, keeps, it, keeps them, it keeps them from cherry picking the high income people and they get everybody engaged in the political fight. Yes, how okay. did uh, Biden, 
and Clinton and Obama all run, I'm only going to tax the top 2%, only going to tax the top 2%. Now they lied and went after energy taxes for everybody, but to get into office, only going to tax the 2%. Uh, that's the Richard Speck theory of tax increases. And if you can't take on everybody in the room at once, you take them out of the room one at the time. Uh, and that's been very successful for the left. So the more states have a single rate tax, the left can raise taxes. And single rate taxes are easy to reduce because when you cut them, everybody's going to benefit the same amount. You Everybody gets understand. happy. Hey, yeah. one thing that surprised me when I was doing a bit of research for this is that the left coast, I mean, you would expect these numbers. Uh, um, Oregon has an 8.9% income tax and California, of course, tops that at 133 but I was surprised to see that Washington state doesn't seem to have an income tax. What, uh, what's happening there? Constitutional amendment forbidding it. Okay. But keep in mind that the left there keeps passing legislation to tax capital gains, which of course is income. And the court has slapped them down several times. There is a hope on the left that another round of let's pretend, they want to call it an excise tax it's on, mm -hmm. on capital gains and to see if they could fool the court. This court might agree with them. It's not impossible. So keep your eye, don't move to Washington until we see what the court does. They may decide to tax capital gains, in which case mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether Amazon and uh, <laughs> and uh, you know Bill Gates's team will wanna stay in that state. Well, certainly they're, you know, with the drop in the stock price, I suppose they're less, they're, <laughs> It's not as bad as it would have been, but it's going to be pretty bad. So the, they're hoping so the, it comes up too. <laughs> so the so the so just do a big picture here. How many sure. states still still have an income tax? Uh, well, eight states don't. So forty two have an income tax. Okay. So, but is there any? So I assume that most of the blue states have, although South Carolina seems to be an outlier here. Most of the blue states have higher taxes, and red states have lower. Yes, in general, red states have lower taxes, blue states have higher taxes. Uh, but and some of the some of those blue states became red very recently: Arkansas, um, West Virginia, others. Uh, South Carolina, you know, it was technically Republican for a while, but the kind of Republicans who say, "I go to church from time to time. I have three guns. I'm a Republican," and they forget the bit about not stealing people's money and giving it to your friends. Uh, but more of the states over time are becoming real Reagan Republican states as opposed to painted red blue states. Uh, so I think we're doing very well. 10 states are in the process of moving to zero. They've self-described, we're going to zero. The governor, the state legislature, some have started it. Uh, Kentucky has passed a lot, 10 year phase down to zero. Louisiana, a 15 year phase down. Their triggers and the way people do this now, modeled after North Carolina, the most successful state and the state that's been doing it the longest is they say, this is what we're going to spend. When the income, when revenue pops up above that, we permanently cut the income tax, not some other tax. Don't give the money to the teachers union, cut the tax. And so you just keep taking the income tax down and you pay for lower and lower and no income tax by reining in spending. That's how you do it. You don't just pick it up and throw it on top of the sales tax. That cost Mr. Martinez his job in Florida. And it cost uh, Bobby Jindal the chance to ever be president because the reaction against their going to zero, which was just take the present income tax, throw it on top of the sales tax and go, see, I made the income tax disappear and everyone goes, we hate you. Look what you did to us on the sales tax. Yeah, so well, that's shifting tax is not a good idea. Trading them for lower spending. Yes. Well, I was struck by the fact that, you know, if you look at the uh, individual income taxes across the state's general revenue, they only average 18% of the total revenue to the states. And the big number um, state revenues is, uh, are the, what they call generously, the intergovernmental transfers, which I guess is the Medicaid and et cetera payments from the federal government. I mean, is that, I mean, that, that's a big number. That's a third of the, uh, the state spending. How, do, how does that factor into this? Well, it, it doesn't affect it because that's, that, that funds certain programs and then and that's it. Um, although when the government was just throwing money at states, a lot of the states took that money and used it to help speed up phasing down the income tax. Uh, you certainly saw in West Virginia, 
Uh, they're looking to do that. And they did it in Arizona. A lot of states it made it easier to begin the process of phasing down the income tax, knowing that they had this extra money, um, at least temporarily had the extra money to move it forward. But that got them going. Uh, so you, North Dakota is looking to go to zero. The governor's taking the lead on that. The House is supportive. The Senate will be there. Um, they'll be at no, no income tax fairly soon, but they're going to go to a one and a half percent single rate and then down. Uh, Arizona went to two and a half and then they go to zero. Uh, you saw Arkansas just announced they're, they're planning to go to zero with both legislative and the new governor ran on this issue. Uh, so we've got, and North Carolina has been doing this for 12 years. They'll be at complete zero no corporate, no individual income tax within the next eight years, just depending on how growth uh, goes there. South Carolina's announced they're going, but they've just started taking yeah. baby steps. Well, the the it seems like a political no-brainer. I mean, who's against uh, going to a zero income tax except maybe some progressive billionaires who feel guilty about uh, about their wealth? What uh, is there? It, it seems like a winner, even if you're uh, a Democrat politician. Well, interestingly, um, the Democrat who ran for governor in South Carolina lost, but uh, he ran. He endorsed the idea of phasing down to zero because the Republican yeah. had. So it's not impossible. Polis of Colorado is a big tax and spender, but on the income tax, he said it should be zero. And the initiative process has been put up twice to cut the 5% rate down to I think about 4.5% now. So they're taking bites at it, moving. It's a single rate tax, so it's easy to cut in Colorado. So there we're seeing in a blue state, people voting again and again every two years to take the rate down just a bit. Well, it seems like the wind is at their back or has been at their back for the last couple of years. I mean, the, uh, you know, we, uh, the federal government had ran like a $3 trillion deficit in 2020. And because of the, uh, the, the lockdowns and the pandemic, uh, uh, checks that they were sending to people. And then they ran almost a $2.8 trillion deficit in 2021. Didn't a lot of that money go to the states? And so they had a lot of extra, a lot of extra cash to, to, to see, to say that you don't need the income tax. Was that helpful? And, well, and now that yes. that's. Yeah. So, go ahead. Somewhat. But when they're cutting the income tax rates, they're doing it with ongoing revenue. They're not going, we have a billion dollars. Let's cut the income tax in half because we can spend the billion dollars because what happens next year? They, they're they being very, very cautious. They're, it, they're doing it over a series of years. Nobody wants to get ahead of their ski tips. They We've learned a lot, Americans for Tax Reform, the group I run, we've done conference calls between the various governors and legislative leaders say, here, you know, what are you looking to do? What's everybody else looking to do? We've created a community where each of the governors understands fully well that most other Republican governors are phasing down to zero or significantly cutting tax. Idaho hasn't said we're going to zero. I don't know what's wrong with them, but they keep <laughs> cutting taxes. They've had a series of substantial tax cuts, just and we're going to zero is not on their list of things to do. Uh, even in Montana, which has no sales tax, they've been taking their rate down with a stated goal of going from seven and a half to five. So they're taking it down uh, without you know, waiting for, they're not going to go to zero because the income tax is the thing that they use, but they're taking it down. When people say, well, how do you pay for not having an income tax? How does Florida pay for it? Florida, 22 million people. New York, 20 million. Florida spends 100 billion on state government. It's a lot, 100 billion. New York, twice as much, 200 billion. So the roads aren't any better in, up, up, up in New York. The public safety and cops aren't any better. Schools aren't any better. They hire more government employees, pay them more, and have ridiculous pensions. That's what you get for twice the cost of state government. Um, and that's why you don't need an income tax. I mean, New York wouldn't need an income tax if they spent half as much. So the key is spending restraint, but having a single rate tax makes it tougher for them to raise taxes. So uh, how much... Uh, how much... <laughs> How much can ATR take credit for this? Seems to me you've been talking about this for 25 years, 30 years. I think it, well, we've been helpful in speeding it up. Yeah. Because I've gone, I talked to each of the governors and uh, and state legislative leaders, and we, we run a meeting in Washington, D.C., a Wednesday meeting with last week, 100 uh, people in the meeting and 30 from other states and overseas uh, coming in by Zoom equivalent. And 
So we talk about what's going on. And then 45 states have similar meetings. Some states like Florida has four, New York has two, Texas has two, uh, Florida, California is gonna get a whole string of them, uh, just one right now. And that allows all the parts of the center-right movement to talk to each other. But then we take the leaders of those groups and they talk to each other. So when we were trying, we were working with uh, the governor, the state leader, state Senate leader in uh, Kentucky and about what he was looking to do, I said, you might talk, you know, here's some people that are doing different things. And I gave him the name of the Senate leader in uh, New, New North Carolina and the, Senate, and the House leader uh, in Mississippi. Those were his best friends. So he called them on the phone and said, how have you guys been doing this? Because they've been doing it for a while. And then next thing I knew, he passed legislation. So when, the, when, when speakers and state legislative leaders and governors talk to each other and learn from each other, that's very helpful. And with the meetings, we try and do that with the outside groups and the legislators, well, but then we well, bring the states together, it's helpful. Well, your meetings, your Wednesday meetings are incredibly effective at pulling people together. But I think the thing you've innovated is those are happening at the state level, yeah. which is where all, this, where all this action is. And my guess is most people got the, uh, the arguments and the statistic to make their case uh, from these meetings. So, you, you know, you're doing a lot of good. And- Thank you. Uh, where does sale taxes come into this? Because we're, I want to talk in a, in a little bit about the, the so-called fair tax, which mm -hmm. some congressmen, Republican congressmen, are trying to get at the federal yeah. level. Um, that's, a, that's a detailed conversation. But let's just talk about the state sales taxes. Right now, the average, the average about 23% of the total uh, revenue that states generate uh, when they when states are talking about getting rid of the income tax, are they also by being the politicians they are, they're saying, well, we got to raise the sales tax to pay for the uh, the lack of an income tax? Some Well, most states try and do that first. Uh, and they walk into a bridge abutment and discover that that's a very <laughs> unpopular thing to do. Uh, yeah. that, they tried that first in North Carolina. Yeah. North Carolina, which is doing everything right now, did try everything wrong first, okay, just to be fair. Um, and understandably, because nobody else had done this ever, except Alaska, which had oil um, in terms of go to no income tax. So their first thought was move it over to sales taxes. Sales taxes on services are particularly unpleasant. Why? Because if you do people's nails for a living or cut hair, um, your sales are your income. It's right. the same thing. Uh, and so a sales tax is an income tax. It doesn't do you any good. To, and and uh, to have both is death. So they really, really dislike that. It becomes very unpopular. Uh, now, the sales tax has an advantage. It's generally a single rate tax. Uh, and you want to keep it low. But the important thing, if you want to keep taxes low and government limited, you want all taxes to, as much as possibly, single rate, not graduated. Um, the income tax needs to be flat, sales tax flat, as opposed to some VATs in Europe where they have different like excise taxes inside the sales tax code. Excise taxes are problematic because you target particular individuals or lifestyles or different, uh, all the government say, oh, we're not taxing you, we're just taxing cigarette smokers. And then they turn around and, and get you somewhere else. So yeah. again, excise taxes are like a progressive tax for the sales tax because they allow you to pick on unpopular people this week. Um, we'll tax them, not you, that we'll get you later, them now. Uh, so the sales tax is, 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 is an interesting tax. It's been around for quite some time. Property taxes are very visible. What you want in taxes is visible so people know what they pay. Mm -hmm. Sales tax has a problem. Do you really know what you paid in sales tax last year? I don't. <laughs> you know, um, I know it was you know X percentage of my what I bought, but I don't know what I paid. Property tax, I can tell you the penny what I paid in property taxes. That's written down. Uh, so sales taxes, nice because they're single rate. Not very, not as transparent as you'd like, um, and you do they do get you in little bits, so you're not quite sure how much you're paying. Well, you know, you look at the trade between property taxes and income taxes. I, you know, we all hear about Florida's no income tax, and so I, a couple of years ago, I looked at buying a property down there, and one of the things that jumped out in like the first five minutes is the property taxes on, uh, on uh, in Florida, which are quite high. But you've made me feel better knowing that the overall tax burden is still lower than it would be if I still lived in New York or, or Illinois. Or I seem to go to high 
tax places to live new york illinois and dc Ooh, I got yeah. I, I've got a I've got a I've got a I've got to change that pattern. <laughs> really uh, one of the things to keep in in mind as you look at this is you, you want few taxes that uh, if you those New Jersey had a say that again you want a few, few a lower number of taxes many. you don't want ten different things you want one or two. Yes. Okay. And the reason is all taxes are raised to the breaking point to the point where politicians careers are broken so they raise the property tax until there's a revolt and they come down a little bit they raise the sales tax until there's a revolt, comes down a little bit income tax that comes down a now you've got three though every one of them just under the political breaking point uh of, and they want tested every once in a while to see if maybe they can get a little more out of that uh but with property taxes the real sin there is local government and mm. one of the problems even some red states texas 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 get into is that state politicians get yelled at because people say our property taxes are so high well, go talk to your mayor okay yeah uh, go talk to your school board Th they're yeah. the guys doing that to you but instead they go oh we've got money we'll cut your property taxes what's that mean we'll give your the politicians that can't control themselves we'll give them money so that when they spend too much we'll steal it from you in sales tax <laughs> not in property tax and then you'll <laughs> thank us even though the government's not any smaller and the bill isn't any bigger, it's just some of it's hidden in your state taxes. Why would a red state ever subsidize incompetent blue mayors? Incompetent blue mayors should be defeated and replaced by people who can keep spending under control. That's the way to control uh, property taxes, not subsidize incompetence by having red state legislators steal your money and then give it to blue mayors. What, so they can hire democratic precinct workers? Who yeah. thought this up, okay? Uh, and it's a huge problem in North Dakota, Nebraska, Texas. The, the red states have gotten suckered into subsidizing blue cities. That has to end. So that's why Gavin Newsom wants to be president, so we can get the federal government into subsidizing blue state uh, blunders, of oh, which yes. is, 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 a, is, a, is probably at the top of that list. Uh, what about the, what you, we, we talk about the, the revenue side, the taxes, a different level. Oh, I what, did want to make one point. So going from a vast number of taxes to a couple taxes, you, you, you mean we don't have to play whack-a-mole all the time where something goes up and goes down. We can just focus on the one or two things and get everybody to buy in. There's so if we're thinking, keys. if you, if you're, if you're, if you're listening to this or thinking about taxes, you ought to be talking to your politicians about one tax. And then we've got to have a conversation about how high that's going to be. Um, yeah, yeah, one quick thing. New Jersey, 1965, only property tax. Much too high, have to fix it. Let's have a sales tax. Then we'll have lower property taxes. 65, they put that in. 77, yeah. oh my goodness, we have a sales tax and very high property taxes. We must fix this. Let us take a third tapeworm and swallow that, an income tax. Now New Jersey has a high income tax, a high sales tax, and high property taxes. Yeah. They didn't solve any problem by creating new taxes. They made it worse. Well, uh, this is the Bill Walton Show, and I'm talking with the great Grover Norquist, founder of Americans for Tax Reform. We're talking about the politicians' infinite ability to come up with new ways to take your money uh, through through uh, subtle taxes. We talked about the revenue. Let's talk about the spending side. I, and you mentioned states are beginning to cut their spending relative to GDP and relative to the population. The big numbers that the state and local spend is uh, – K-12 education, Medicaid, children's health, higher education, colleges, thats that captures almost 60, 65% of, of state and local budgets. Are they, are they going after that spending? And if so, how, they're, how are they doing it? There's a very interesting, virtuous circle, cycle going on here. The Democrats wanted to get the states to pay more of the education budget because they couldn't get as much money as they wanted to out of cities and the property tax, towns and cities. So they got the states to send everybody in New Hampshire $4,500 per student. They got the state constitution to the state uh, Supreme Court to say, when it says you should cherish education, we understand cherish to mean as judges, $4,500. That's what cherish means. <laughs> they, no kidding. Okay, And so that's what they got. I look, that's now, in the fourth fourth definition in Webster's. You cherished forty yes, five hundred dollars. <laughs> My guess is it goes up every once in a while in, in the judge's <laughs> minds too. It's a little somewhat fluid. 
but pretty sure it means at least $4,500. In uh, New Hampshire, two years ago, they passed uh, a law, an education savings account, so that $4,500 of state tax revenue goes to each to a school for each per student they have. That's what they did. Now they said, if you make less than $80,000, you can ask for that $4,500 to go to the school of your choice hmm. or to you if you homeschool, okay? Hmm. So um, they that's the 80,000. They want it to go to everybody, but they did it for people who earn less than 80,000. So they make it a form of voucher or I, I know that you're not supposed to use the V word, but that's, but that's the good thing they're doing. That's exactly what they're doing. And then Arizona to top, to get do even better said, no cap on income. Every citizen, we started these things. We did it for handicapped kids. We did it for troubled children. We did it for very poor children. We did it for people in certain cities to give them school choice. And then because nobody died and the world got better and parents liked it and even the teachers liked it. Um, so now what Arizona passed was their $6,500 there, Cherish, I don't think they have Cherish in their constitution or it'd be 4,500. Uh, their $6,500 per child goes to the parent if the parent asks not to the school uh, that they go to. So, uh, and then all the other states, Texas, Iowa, that are all looking to do this, uh, Arkansas, they're all doing the everything like the Arizona model. So the, the people who started to do school choice in Florida and Wisconsin, uh, Jeb Bush and Tommy Thompson and so on, they really got the ball rolling with some very small, you know, people, why aren't you doing it for everybody? Because we don't have the votes to do it for everybody, idiot. <laughs> get you know, get this, you know, plant the small seed, come back, and all of a sudden you've got an oak tree, and not only an oak tree, but you've got dozens of would-be oak trees. Every red state is a likely state to enact very extensive school choice. And as you were saying, that's about half K through 12 is about half of state and local spending. Um, so if you voucherize that, if you make that under the control of parents, the teachers' union now has zero interest in that number because yeah. they don't get that money unless they've got a school that everybody really likes, in which case you don't need the union to raise your taxes to get money for you. People are bringing their voucher, their scholarship with them. So taking a half of state and local spending and making it competitive, it's as if everybody got a voucher to go to the post office mm -hmm. or UPS. You'd never have to privatize the post office. You just did it. Yeah. Does it act like a private sector company or go out of business? So the let me let me diverge a bit from the the money piece of this to the social the cultural wars we're in. I mean, I, I look at these numbers for K twelve education uh, and higher education, and I think about a lot of the bad stuff that's in the curriculum. I mean, is there is there any initiative among the legislatures and some of the, particularly in some of these red states to tie dollars to to uh, to the institutions are funding to uh, to curriculum changes and uh, and and getting it back into teaching American civics and all those other sorts of uh, antiquated ideas. There there are proposals, and in Florida, you see the state says everybody should do this. I much prefer the other approach, which is: Do you have dirty books in your school library? You know what? No problem. But any parent who objects to dirty books in their school library can take their local money and their state money, go to any school they want. So nobody's saying you can't have ridiculous okay. books in your library, but anyone, any parent who wants out should be able to take all of their money that could, that's taken in their name for their kid's education and go anywhere they want. It is the teacher's union that will go into those libraries and tear up all those books because they don't want to drive people oh, well, out of their school. I, I, I love that idea. I mean, just, you know, if, if, you, if you're losing the money, you're funding because of this bad stuff, get rid of the bad stuff and maybe you'll keep the money. I like that. Yeah, it, that becomes self- I like having a Harvard MBA in charge of uh, thinking through all these incentives. It, it seems to be helpful. <laughs> incentives do matter, even for government workers. But what about the funding for the universities? I mean, I talked about the Harvard MBA and Harvard. I mean, I, I, I won't give money to Indiana University anymore, which is where I went to school, uh, because I don't like what they're teaching. I don't like what's happening on the campus. I don't like the fact that Indiana University has the highest uh, number of uh, diversity officers of any university in the country. 
Um, not sure why, but they do. Uh, so a lot of this, and if you look at the growth in spending and in particular what they call higher education, almost all of it's come at administrative cost. And almost all of that is in the form of these uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Yeah, um, that is a huge challenge. Uh, there are a couple of opportunities. One is uh, governors do not, when, when somebody runs for governor, when uh, they may tell you, I'll nominate conservative judges. They yeah. may tell you, I won't raise your taxes. They almost never come in with a, public or private plan to reform schools. But you now see with uh, the governor of Virginia and the governor of Florida, both looking about their appointments as to who's running these universities much more mm -hmm. seriously. We had even good conservative governors in the past would put people on the board of directors of universities in Colorado, for instance. Republicans had that a long time because they wanted free tickets to the football game. Because, and they would go along to get along and they just, okay, sure. whatever the school president says, instead of going, we run this university, we have some concerns, you work for us, Mr. School President, university president, not the other way around. Same thing, school boards with uh, people who run local uh, public high schools and, and uh, K, K through 12. So th they're, one, we need to teach Republican governors and mayors and school boards, you run this thing. What is all this whining about? You run it, okay? But it also means you have to do this march through the institution because any governor can only appoint so many trustees in a given year. Like with the Supreme Court, you got to go on and on and on. And one of the conservative governors from uh, Virginia uh, put uh, Bill Crystal on one of these things and he voted with the teachers because sure. he's from an academic background and they, he thought the teachers should run the university. They go, no, Bill, that's not, that's not the way it works. So, you, but, you know, we had Souter, the governor of Virginia had, had Crystal, just somebody he thought because he was a conservative um, that he would know what to do. You need somebody who's actually thought through how this works. So one, governors, school boards need to take control of their educational facilities and, and, and use that power that they actually have. Two, um, I think we're gonna see high tech companies and others um, make college redundant or un, unimportant for most tech jobs. What you do is you go to yeah. um, you know, Apple University, like there's a McDonald's University um, where they teach you how to be a McDonald's manager. Uh, and then you're off to the races. What would four years of college do for you? It's more important than knowing how to run a McDonald's and then being able to do one, two, three, or four. Uh, same thing with all these tech issues. They have very specific needs. They can teach you how to get a job coding or in these the areas where they know they're hiring, where you know their jobs available. Those should be run by the by the businesses themselves, not by some college which has written a an article about Apple, and then he's an expert on Apple or what Apple needs. You need people who have real real skills imparted. Then I think you start defunding the public, the, the the universities out of that job. But just one last thought here. One of the major problems in universities is that half or more of the money goes to research, which basically means people read write articles about uh, black chemistry and stuff, which they share with other people, and no, there's no value to them. Uh, and then half of the money maybe goes to educate the kids. We should separate that out. The federal government shouldn't be doing odd duck research. I'm not talking about you know trying to decide how to make atoms do something interesting. The kind of research where people write papers about other people's papers and other people's books and French literature. It may be interesting. Maybe people should do it on their own. But there's no reason the federal government should steal anybody's money so well, some university professor well, can have well, fun not working. Well, you're you're exactly right. I mean, you, you the the word research at thirty five thousand feet sounds glorious. We all want research, but when you look at all the the bad stuff that that funds and how how destructive a lot of it is, uh, yeah. you know, it's not just the dollars, but how that's dollars those dollars are putting to use makes me think about our defense department. But that's another discussion for another day. Yeah. Hey, let's shift gears to. Uh, I mean, you know, you and I. <laughs> You know, you, you know so many things. Cole, I want to talk with you about it all. Uh, this is the Bill Walton Show. I'm talking with Grover Norquist, founder of the very effective Americans for Tax Reform. 
and we've been talking about state and local taxes and and how what it funds and what we can do to correct some of the some of the things that it's funding that we don't think should be funded. Um, but let, let's 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 shift this argument or this discussion to the federal level. We talked about state taxes, Grover. There's now a um, a bill I think that's put put out in, uh, in in Congress, new new Republican slender majority in the House that wants to introduce something called the fair tax. And I think this was one of the conditions that got uh, McCarthy the vote to become speaker. Yes, uh, and that, reportedly one congressman said, I'll only vote for you if you have an up and down vote on the fair tax. Yeah. Uh, and if you're McCarthy, once the five decided they had to have things, anyone who didn't ask for something was a sucker. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of promises that are made, not all of them necessarily helpful to maintaining the Republican majority or having limited government. Uh, this is one of those. This is entirely well-meaning. Good people thought it up. A couple of billionaires out of Texas spent a lot of money promoting it. They used to come and talk to me about this 20 years ago, and they told me their plan to pass a constitutional amendment to get rid of the income tax and put in a sales tax um, over the next 10 months, <laughs> they had a 10-month plan to do this. Uh, so it, it wasn't particularly well thought out politically. Uh, and and <laughs> Gil Bortz was the radio talk show host in Atlanta, which is why when you look at the people who co-sponsored the bill, there are only 25 or 24 Republicans who co-sponsored the fair tax. It used to be 75. Over time, people have realized the dangers of the issue to them politically. Uh, and so it's down to 24. They tend to all be in, 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 in Georgia, Northern Florida, South Carolina, because that's where they had Neil Bortz was talking all the time. Well, the headline's a very attractive one, which is we're going to get rid of the, the income tax. We're going to get rid of the Internal Revenue Service. And it's going to be very simple. We're just going to have a tax on your consumption, both personal consumption and business consumption. Very simple. Yeah. Of course, we're going to have to create a new bureau called the Sales Tax Bureau. Um, and we might also have to create one called the Excise Tax Bureau. So there, once you start wading into the weeds, it gets a little less, uh, the field looks a little, a little less attractive. I have great sympathy and admiration for let's get rid of the income tax, which we've been doing at the state, working on at the state level. Uh, and let's do something about the IRS being too intrusive, too abusive, and too political. Okay. Those are both, we need to do those. Neither of those require creating a new 30% sales tax, which is if you buy something for $100, it'll cost you $130. Now 30 goes to the government. That's the way, that's what they, the way they get to 30. Um, and we've seen what happened. Uh, DeMint, the former senator from South Carolina was running, he endorsed yeah. it. They almost took his head off. He almost lost that election because they spent a million to $2 million saying, you know all the problems you have in life? DeMint wants to add a 30% sales tax. They don't say, and get rid of the income tax because that's not what opposition ads do. <laughs> they don't give your side of the story. So if you have a policy, which is has a very scary part and a nice part, how does it get played by the media or by your opponent's advertising? They focus on the dead, deep cost. They almost got Nancy Mace with the same thing. Uh, we've had real trouble with people, getting people across the finish line because of this. If the Republicans get associated with it. And that's what Biden is trying to do. He's giving a series of speeches and another one coming up saying, this is the Republican plan. The Republican Party's never voted for this. It's never been on a platform. It's never been voted on. It's never gone through Ways and Means Committee. It's the idea supported sort of by 24 people, uh, none of whom have gotten a vote on it. Um, but mm -hmm. we need to make sure that more Republicans don't get stuck into this trap. And getting back to your point about the constituency for this, I mean, the, the dirty little secret, it's not so secret, is over half of Americans don't pay an income tax. I mean, there's there's some, you know, FICA and things like that, but not not an income tax. And But this 30% increase on purchases would affect everybody. And it's a big number. And, and of if, course, we also know politically, if you did get a fair tax passed in part, well, we wouldn't really get rid of the income tax. We'd have to keep... Uh, what, what do you think about this? One of the things that's always troubled me, and I know you were in grade school talking about how you didn't like taxes. If we'd been around in 1912, when was it they created the Internal Revenue Service? It was 1912, 1914. Yeah. 1914. What it did 
and it's really apparent now, it wasn't apparent then, is it gave the federal government the right to look into your income, all its sources, all your expenses, all the ways you you live your life through through your the information you have to provide to what's now the Internal Revenue Service. You know, I think the attract the the attraction for me for a fair tax is 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 the privacy issue. I mean, uh, but it's, you know that that that's a I don't think in the world of the politically possible that uh, politicians are going to give up their right to know all your personal life through your tax return. If they passed a law that says the IRS is gone and uh, the income tax is over, now have a sales tax. The next time the Democrats won the House, the Senate, the presidency, which happens from time to time, they put <laughs> the income tax back because right. the Constitution specifically says you can have an income tax. Right. And the idea that we're going to get three quarters of the legislature to ban an income to, 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 to uh, ban an income tax and two thirds of the House and Senate to ban an income tax, that is never happening. So which has got to which has got to be parcel which has got to be paired with the with the fair tax, which is the constitutional amendment you'd need or or, or repealing that constitutional amendment, then that's uh, that's an impossibility. Right now, if if you if you had the votes to get rid of the constitution and switch over to a sales tax, you would also have the votes to dramatically take the income tax down, 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 down the way we're doing at the state level. Why would you, if we had both houses of the legislature and two thirds and all those states, why would you spend any time swapping one tax for another? Just take right. the taxes we have and bring them down. <laughs> you know, for heaven's sakes, if you have the, you know, if you can imagine one vote that allows you to do X, Y, and Z, well, take that strength and cut spending so you don't need as much taxes. A couple of things that are in the top in the in the. Headline right now, headlines in the last year or so, and right now is the uh, the debt ceiling. I mean, I look at the deficits we've run, um, all financed by debt, three trillion in 2020, 2.8 trillion in 2021. Now it's a mere one trillion in 2022, and I think that's what it's projected to be in 2023. What should, how should we think about the debt ceiling? The debt ceiling allows the out of power party to tell the in power party, um, we will only let you have the debt ceiling increase if we get X. But half the time the debt ceiling has been increased, there has been conditions attached to it. Uh, new polls out from uh, Harvard uh, Harris poll, Mark Penn's poll and company uh, poll uh, that 63% of Americans think that if you're gonna raise the debt ceiling, there should be some requirement of spending restraint. Yeah. Uh, back in 2011, when we went through the same process, exact same process, it was also 60% of people thought you should have a spending requirement. What the Democrats wanted in 2011 was tax increases, uh, some spending restraint. They wanted to cut Social Security and Medicare, okay, um, because they don't think that generates the votes for them that social welfare spending does. So they're willing to cut those if you raise taxes. Uh, and the Republicans said, we're not raising taxes. And they also said, and by the way, we're not so stupid as to think we'd walk into a room with you and you say we've agreed to uh, cut Social Security and raise taxes. And when we walk out the door and say we've agreed to cutting taxes, raising taxes and, and cutting Social Security, you're going to walk away from that and we'll be the party of cutting um, Social Security. There's no way you're going to publicly, you're going to make us carry that. So the Republicans said, that's a trap. Although I see in the newspaper today that some Republicans are going in the Senate, this might work. Okay, we went through this. They, I wish these people weren't 12 years old and didn't know what happened in 2011. Uh, they, they, we've done this before. They tried to get us to cut Social Security. They tried to get us to raise taxes. And yeah. Republicans said, we want tax redu spending reduction, spending reduction of $2 trillion over 10 years, not tomorrow, over 10 years, in order to give you the $2 trillion in additional debt ceiling. That's exactly what we got. It is exactly what we got. It was it was Obama who agreed to it. It was Biden who negotiated it. So we've all been there. So all this screaming is going to end the world, or we have to raise taxes, or nobody's ever had a condition on this. It's all nonsense. You go back. I've been reading the old newspapers, and everything that they say today is what they said then. And where did we end up? In a very good place. No tax increase, not a penny, and spending restraint. But nothing got smashed to smithereens. They just cut everything a little bit. And we should do that again. So, so how does this? Well, even that two ten two trillion dollars sounds like a lot, but it still leaves us with an eight hundred billion dollar deficit every year. So it's not 
not exactly draconian. So we're in, I, this, this show tends to be a little, little longer shelf life material, but we're now in late January uh, 2023. How does this latest debt ceiling drama end? And uh, it'll end in, Jan in June, just as they get up to the deadline. And I think it'll be if the Republicans can hold 218 in the House. And that means you have to sit down the five guys who do performance art instead of be congressmen and make them <laughs> agree. We're going to have this position. We need you to agree. Because otherwise, if we walk out of this room and any one of you walks and says, we're not with the deal, then, no, then we have no credibility. And then the deal will be done in the Senate. OK, and when I was reading this thing about, oh, we're going to do the tax increase and Social Security, it was a couple of senators. They could and would do you, that. You Senate. don't want a deal done in the Senate. No, but with it, the 18 but, votes for the uh, one point yeah. seven trillion monstrosity last month. And what you now need to, to do is to say to people who just had fun voting with the Democrats 14 times in a row, you've got to agree that we're going to come up with one plan and what however good a deal yeah. we get. We delivered 218 votes. We've already seen the head of the Freedom Caucus go say, you know, that one to one agreement we had, like, we need four to one. Now, if that's a negotiating position, that's fine. But if he really believes that he can get that and he's yeah. not going to vote for anything else, well, then he's just made not himself irrelevant, the entire House irrelevant. No one will talk to anybody in the House. They'll do it in the Senate and they'll go back and pick up five moderates to go with all the Democrats with whatever the Senate agrees to. And the House will be in. It's not one guy says, I have a ridiculous demand it means you're irrelevant. You make the House irrelevant, all done by the Senate and not by the Senate, but by nine Republicans and all D's. That's how they well, make it. That's, that's the best argument I've I've heard about keeping a 218 to vote on 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 what what's acceptable. Boy, you go to the, you go to the Senate, you might as well just hand it to Biden. But, but that's <laughs> why we got that's why the Senate did the spending yeah. deal without waiting for the house because they looked sure. as it was, wait for what house there's no 218 there we'll cut the best deal we can you guys in the house will live with it because you can't get your act together yeah. if, it, if they can get 218 act together they can dominate this town but they got to have 218 okay one item we got to get out of here i've already taken way too much of your time but i could probably spend I'm five time. six hours um Janet Yellen came back with a long face not too long ago because she'd gone to a very fancy resort. I can't remember where in Europe or someplace exotic, feeling like she hadn't gotten the uh, the tax treaty she wanted, which would cause all the states, all the governments, all the all the countries to to, to have a minimum tax that they would charge, so that you couldn't have com countries competing with other countries based on a lower tax burden. Um, I know, explain why that's a bad idea for everybody to have the same, quote, low taxes. And and also, where, where's the pushback coming against that? Sure. Uh, this is something the Europeans have always wanted. They consider the United States, when we cut our corporate rate down to 50 and then 28, they didn't like that at all. The Europeans all followed us and went way under 28 because it was such a good idea. But now they don't like the idea of Ireland and Hungary and some of these other countries having 12 and a half or 8 percent. Um, taxes because they don't want to have to compete with that. And the point of fact, they should have to compete with it. We right. should have been at 15. That's what Trump wanted to do. We got stuck at 21. I mean, 21 was much better than 35. Don't get me wrong. But we wanted 15. We still should go to 15. That should be where we are. And we should want lower taxes in America compared to Europe or the rest of the world. Not the same. You don't want to cartel. What in the states, the reason why states are going to zero and lower is so they can compete. But if you could have had a bunch of states get together or the federal government come out and figure out how to say, no one can have a tax lower than 10%, then yeah. every state would have a 10% income tax. And so there's no reason for them to do better. So incentives matter. And if you lower taxes, you get you attract capital, you attract capital, you get investment. Investment creates uh, people building things and creating jobs. And all of a sudden, people are getting uh, richer and, and happier. And that. Yeah. Uh, OK, the Europeans well, uh, do not want to have to work during the summer and they're trying to figure out some way to slow us down. <laughs> well, I don't really want to work during the summer either. But anyway, that's uh, Grover. This has been fantastic and, and to be continued because there are a lot of things that we didn't get to cover today. Um, how about a last word on what you're doing with ATR and, and how we how people can support you? 
Sure. Americans for Tax Reform, we share with all state legislators and uh, House and Senate leaders, uh, members, uh, would you sign the pledge never to raise taxes? And we have most Republicans in the House and the Senate, state legislatures, most go Republican governors have made that commitment in writing that they'll never raise taxes. It's what stopped tax increases back in 2011 and 2013. Uh, it is what's allowed us at the state level to say no to Democratic governors and Republican governors to say no to every spending idea. So the pledge, when you talk to somebody who's running for office, have they signed the pledge, a written pledge to the people of your state, not to me, as Obama used to say, but to the people of their state uh, right. that they that they tend to keep. And since 1994, no Republican in D.C. has voted for a tax increase. They've all kept their pledge. And since 94, when we started keeping the pledge, the Republicans have controlled Congress 60 percent of the time. Previously, it was four years out of 64 years. So by being the party that won't raise taxes, the Republicans became competitive mm -hmm. in, in Washington, D.C., where they weren't before. So what we want to do is move that stronger in every single state. Uh, and then the next big project, how it is, is uh, local government, mayors, uh, school boards, uh, all the various districts and so on. We need to take the no tax increase commitment to local government as well as state uh, and federal. Uh, I tweet at Grover Norquist. Our website is ATR, Americans for Tax Reform, ATR.org. Uh, and we'd uh, love to, to hear from you. Grover, thank you. Thank you. This has been the Bill Walton Show. And as we just heard, we're here, we're here with Grover Norquist. And as always, you can find us on all the major podcast platforms and on Substack and on YouTube and on Rumble. Um, I don't think we said anything today that would get us kicked off YouTube, but uh, you never know. Uh, and as always, uh, we, we welcome your comments either in Substack or on our website, thebillwaltonshow.com. And so for thanks for joining and I hope you learned a lot. I certainly did. And we'll have Grover back.